Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Ullas Karanth. I'm currently Emeritus Scientist and uh, uh, nominally the Managing Trustee of Center for Wildlife Studies. I used to lead the WCS program in India for 30 years before I retired and took up this assignment. And uh, I have worked with tigers for a fairly long time, going back all the way to 67, 1967, if you count conservation, and uh, 1986, if you count research. So in the course of this, it has been my real pleasure to interact with, mentor many, many bright people. And I'm absolutely delighted today to have two of the best among them as my guests. I'll be the moderator of the show. Uh, one is uh, Dr. Anak Patanavibul. I met Anak in the year 2000 or 1998 actually. Uh, and he was a professor at that time in the Kassetsart University, uh, but he was such a practically minded, bright, achieving professor that I played a little role in pulling him out of his professorship and making him the director of WCS Thailand program. And in the last two decades, he's been there. He's done a phenomenal job. And I think what is one of the best science-driven programs within the portfolio of any big cat uh, conservation program, combining both science and uh, practically working with all constituents, working with governments, which is one of the toughest things. So Anak is a real champion. So I'm sure he'll have something very useful to contribute today. And Abhishek Harihar, and I go back even further, I think he was, I was an examiner on his master's when he was a master's student in WII. And there were 13 or 14 of them. And he was clearly outshining the others on the list there. He, he was the star in that interview. And he's maintained that trajectory since then. He finished his master's, then continuously worked in the Wildlife Institute of India, one of the few scientists, in my opinion, who's done the best scientific quantitative population work in WI for many, many years, finishing his master's, finishing his PhD uh, from Darrell Institute, and then joining WWF as a consultant and uh, from 2005, he's moved to another institution that I'm very closely associated with on whose advisory body I serve, which is the Panthera, which was started by my friend, late Alan Rabinovitz and Tom Kaplan. So uh, in that capacity, Abhishek is the scientist who's looking at all the data, monitoring data they're collecting across, across the spectrum. Now, in terms of... Uh, what is monitoring? I want to say a few things so set the stage because I think uh, while people are very interested in tigers and though uh, no monitoring has something to do with numbers of tigers, not many know the nuances involved. Uh, it is not simply going and going for a checker in Rantambore or you know, telling a story about a particular tiger, giving it a name and mentioning its daughters and uncles and all that. Monitoring has a very serious side to it. Uh, and it is very different from loving the tiger, enjoying watching tigers, or even understanding watching tiger behavior. Uh, monitoring deals with populations, essentially. Why is this? This is because conservation is about recovering animal numbers. And sometimes it may be eliminating animals, but conservation essentially the metric of conservation is numbers and monitoring of tigers and their prey or their habitat has to be a quantitative field. So, and this is where I think there's a gap in understanding between the lay public interested in tigers and those who are seriously involved in monitoring because the layers of stuff that goes on in the bureaucracy, in the conservation community, which is neither monitoring nor science, but it's called monitoring. So, what exactly is monitoring? So there are three aspects to this. One is why, why do we monitor? Why do we have to monitor? Because as I said, conservation has three goals to uh, preserve a species that is uh, going down the tube. The second goal, uh, which is not really relevant to tigers, 
In fact, it's been practiced so much that it has become a danger, which is actually using a species, consuming it in some way. In that sense, the relevance to tigers comes see only in a non-consumptive use like uh, tourism. Third one is eliminating, reducing animal numbers. Again, this is not a big issue with tigers, but it does become a big issue when you deal with individual animals that turn into problems. So in, in terms of tigers, it's most mostly about bringing back what was once so abundant and what's now become so rare. And uh, uh, a key to this is to get a scale of the understanding of the numbers that we are talking about, which is if you look at the distribution of tigers, even 300 years ago, they were spread across what are today 30 different countries. Their distribution started in Iraq in one corner and went all the way to a Russian Far East, Vladivostok. And it started in Azerbaijan and Armenia in one corner and went to Bali at the other diagonal opposite. So it was a huge distributional range. Today, they occur only in 6% of that uh, area, about 150,000 square kilometers. And if you look at where the reproducing populations are, it is 6% of that 6%. So we are essentially talking about a species that's been squeezed into one or 2% of its former range in terms of having reproducing populations. So it's really a recovery issue. And in some sense, you can say tiger populations, each tiger population is like a patient in an intensive care ward. And you know how much attention a patient gets in an intensive care ward. You have to monitor the pulse, monitor various other parameters, and that's exactly what we do. So this monitoring is really critical because the patient is in intensive, in intensive care ward. You can look at it that way. So there are three things that come. One is the biology of the species. One is the logistics and the resources you have. And the third one is given these two things, what are the questions you can ask? So there are several questions we can ask to put very simply, where are the tigers? Obviously they were found across this huge region, but now they are in very few places. So where are these populations? And when you ask that question, you again go, where are tigers wandering around? And where are they reproducing? Where are the reproducing populations? The second question is far more critical. This is a much smaller fraction of the area than tigers may be potentially be there or have been there and occasional tiger wanders. If we give the example of India, uh, the actual populations which are reproducing, probably it's about 50, less than 50,000 square kilometers in a country of 3.1 million square kilometers. If you look at the broader distribution, potentially where tigers were say 100 years ago, where they can still come back, where if there's some habitat, it's three, 300,000 square kilometers. So, so one is where are these tigers? And there are ways of measuring them, measuring them accurately. And virtually nowhere are the, is, is this being implemented properly or proper science is brought into the task of ask, answering the simple questions, where are the tigers? At the second level, in some sense, I would pose it as where can the tigers be? So this is about measuring crudely what we can call carrying capacity. Where can the tigers be? Is it possible to get to this even without counting tigers? You, you don't, you're not asking the question how many there are, but you're asking potentially how many can there be because that's a major conservation decision. If you are choosing a thousand square kilometer area in uh, Wefcom in uh, Thailand or in uh, uh, Bandipur Nagarhole or some other productive landscape, or should you go and pick some 50 square kilometer area in some corner of Rajasthan and say, call it a tiger reserve? These decisions are be should be, they're not, but they should be based on potential carrying capacity and the single, there are many factors that influence tiger numbers, but the most primary one, the one that really drives it is the abundance of large prey because tigers cannot survive without large ungulate prey. Typically, a tiger has to make a kill every week, one prey a year, uh, 50 to 50 prey a year. And that needs a population of approximately 10 times as many prey to support, produce that 50 prey a year. 
500 prey will produce 50 prey a year. So the, your capital has to be 500 prey for a single tiger. So when you're talking about a viable population of tigers, we are talking of thousands of prey species. So it's not simply having one tiger getting a photo and getting excited. So you're asking the question, how many tigers? Then the single most important thing is your ability to count prey, monitor prey accurately. Again, not easy, a lot of effort, but there are good statistical ideas as to how this can be done. And the third and most refined level of monitoring. Now we are coming to the intensive care yeah, uh, ward where the populations are reproducing, some are blinking out, some are producing surpluses leading to some conflict. How should these populations be monitored? Then of course we are scaling down, we are coming to that 1% of that 1% sort of. But here, what you need is a really rigorous count of how many tigers are there. And how many tigers uh, are there at a point in time and over time, how many tigers can be there? Uh, how, how many tigers are there each year? And then you get at every question, like uh, what is the survival rate? How many pro uh, are born? How many are reproduced? How many dis So this is the most sophisticated level of monitoring. And the last and almost the impossible task is to answer this question at the scale of the very large landscapes. Going back to your 6% and say exactly how many there are, how many are being born, which, which area has more or less. And the problem with this is, this is an impossible question to answer easily. And unfortunately, most managers, because they are not technically trained across the board, want to take on the most difficult question first. It's like you want to compete in the Olympics first before starting to learn how to play the game. So obviously the numbers you get are absurd because it's, it's an impossible task to get these refined data at that large scale. This is why monitoring has to be tailored to resource needs, the questions, practicality, it gets very complicated. And how do you go about it? There are primarily three, three approaches. At this very large scale, often what you can collect is only uh, signs left by tigers, maybe tracts or something else. And it tells you where tigers are, to put it very crudely. At the next level of measuring carrying capacity, counting prey species, there are better methods. You can use transects, you can use some sort of relative abundance indices of prey. So you can roughly say there can be more tigers in place A than in place B. So that's the next level. And the most uh, difficult level of actually counting tigers and measuring all these difficult parameters like density, survival, and all this. Uh, right now, we have one good methodology, which is camera trapping, which developed over time. But getting a photo is different from doing real statistically rigorous estimate with the camera traps. Because if you don't use the right methods, camera traps can give you the most in misleading information. This has been a big problem because it's sophisticated. It's uh, the cameras are expensive. People get excited, but the data are not used right. The second approach where cameras are difficult to deploy or get stolen or there is some other challenge is you can now relatively identify tigers individually from the DNA you can extract from their scats or if you can snag their hair in hair snares from the this is DNA-based identification. Still, there is greater variation in it compared to, say, stripes. And also, I think it's more boring to look at scats than look at tiger pictures. So anyway, the, these are all three approaches, science, counting of prey, looking at prey and counting them, and looking at tigers, either photos or DNA, require extremely advanced statistical model. It is not a simple task. It's not what you read in the papers. It's very hard. And unless it's done right, it gives highly misleading information. It's like a thermometer gives you a wrong reading. And that's often what happens. So that's just by way of introduction. So what I would like now to do is invite my colleagues who are here, starting with Anak, uh, ask them fundamentally two or three questions. One is give a little bit of background of the area that you have been working on. About, of course, Anak works on hornbills also. I don't want him to talk about hornbills. <laughs> it's specifically 
He works in the area, in my opinion, is the best tiger habitat in all of Asia, potentially. It is as big as all the forest in Western Ghats, and it's one circular shape. And it's very high quality. Western Forest Complex in Thailand has dedicated his life to working there. So I want to give him a bit of his experience, his uh, knowledge of the area about tigers. And I have seen, I've been involved with this research. Tigers have come back spectacularly in this area in the last two decades he's been there. I want him to talk a little bit about it and maybe I'll prod him a little if necessary. After Anak, uh, Abhishek will talk about his work which spans a much, much of Asia, including India. He's looking at Panthera, which has a diverse portfolio of tiger projects. Some of the tiger, finest tiger biologists like my ex-colleague John Goodrich and others. So I want uh, Abhishek to do more or less the same thing about his portfolio and his experience with monitoring tigers. So Anak. Thank you, Ulus. Uh, before I talk about the landscape that I, uh, I have been doing with the team, I would like to give a brief overview of the situation in Thailand. First, uh, in Thailand, Thailand, the size of Thailand is six times smaller than India. So uh, we have about 20% uh, uh, of the uh, protected forest and uh, for the size of uh, the country of that size with 20% of the protected areas, a lot of people would think it's, uh, it's quite okay. But uh, when you look at the areas that were st still supporting uh, population of tigers, it is down to only 3%, you know, in Thailand. So uh, when uh, we try to think about, you know, conservation and uh, uh, my, my, my background is in wildlife. And uh, at the beginning, uh, when I uh, was studying wildlife, as Ulas mentioned, I, I, I actually am not a tiger guy, but I used to work with different species, uh, mainly birds. But uh, my professor, uh, mainly uh, at that time, taught me how to count dungs uh, in, 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 in wildlife side, they call dung counts. So uh, I did a lot of dung counts, you know, pellet counts without knowing how to link with management. So uh, when I met Ulas uh, more than 20 years ago, uh, uh, he brought us to see, uh, uh, and you know, with my colleague, another key, to key people to India to see uh, how we can link monitoring with management. So I, 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 uh, I and the team at that time feel very impressed uh, because now, now, you, now you understand much better the meaning of counting dunks, when the meaning of counting pellets uh, and for tigers, the meaning of linking it with management uh, or protection. So, uh, when we uh, came back, uh, we talked together among key people in Thailand, and uh, I tried to convince my colleague to try to uh, modify what they, they were doing at that time on monitoring of tigers. So we chose the western part of Thailand, as Ulas mentioned, is the big area. Uh, the size of this landscape is about 18,000 square kilometers. Uh, uh, the government protected this area for many years with about 17 protected areas, you know, national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. And we, we uh, uh, our, one of the key people in our team, he did uh, camera trapping a little bit already. You know, people like camera, trap, camera trapping because, you know, you play with equipment, modern equipment, and very exciting. And people mainly just place camera traps here and there with no system. So uh, we, we try to convince them to try to adopt system in uh, what ULAS use in, in uh, Western Ghat. And uh, it's uh, quite demanding actually, because you have to expand your camera trapping area in, uh, to cover large area using a lot of intensive manpower, uh, expensive equipment, but uh, uh, we, we were able to uh, 
you know, improve the system. Uh, I, 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 I was quite successful in convincing them to, to change the system. And, and, and we, we, we started with camera uh, trap with tiger population first, uh, because, you know, people interest is there already. So then when we uh, expand the system of camera trapping, and then we understand about the population of tigers as the baseline in 2004. Uh, and then we, uh, we try to uh, start another, uh, another monitoring system on tiger spray. Uh, because uh, at that time, uh, people they they when they want to when they they they, they want to recover tigers they, they 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 don't think much about uh, they need to improve prey population too so uh, and uh, and because we want to uh, use the, the the system in India as uh, the baseline if we want to improve tigers if we want to improve large prey species. We want to be able to compare with many successful sites in India. So I tried to convince the team, both government and academy, to uh, use the same system because I believe that uh, if you use the same system, it's to compare. You know, no matter what kind of analysis you want to use, and and it's also demanding also you know setting up extensive line transit across. A thousand square kilometers area is quite labor intensive, and uh, and and we 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 have been able to do it again. And then uh, after we know the base baseline on prey, uh, then we 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 thinking about uh, not only the core area. We know we need to know the whole complex, the situation of the whole complex, and uh, we also follow the same. Uh, protocol used in India by uh, using occupancy survey, which is quite also uh, you know labor intensive to try to uh, cover the area in each grid cell in enough uh, efforts to be able to say with confident about the uh, occupancy of of tigers and prey. So uh, at, at this point, I I think I I, I would like to. Uh, say that you know uh, when you think about using monitoring uh, to guide management, you have to do you know intensive monitoring, not just put camera traps here and there uh, briefly, or line transit uh, in the small area and try to summarize the big areas, or doing occupancy by doing few few sample in only small area and try to. Uh, summarize uh, what's happening at a big landscape. You need to do labor intensive from the field, you know, to, to try to get uh, good data from the field to be able to, be able to do uh, uh, good analysis. You have to uh, done the field right from the beginning. And uh, that's what I have learned uh, uh, from the experience uh, in uh, ULAS and the team has done for, for India. Yep. Anak, I think you should tell a little bit about what the results of your studies have shown from 2005 to latest, broadly. Yeah, so the first year of camera trapping uh, in the area of about uh, uh, 1,000 square kilometers, we, we, we got uh, tigers of uh, about, uh, about uh, 30 tigers at the first year, which is Quite, quite, you know, quite small. But uh, you know, in the situation in Thailand, as I mentioned, tigers are uh, already gone from most forests in Thailand. The, with the area that's the, the first year we started with uh, thirty tigers, uh, uh, we, we 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 feel that uh, at least we have something to to start. And and then uh, over the years from two thousand six until uh, today, we, we've been doing uh, camera trapping uh, every year uh, in almost the same effort. And uh, uh, this year, the numbers of individual tigers we capture from the system uh, is uh, 
uh, almost 70 tigers this year. So it's, 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 it's quite impressive. In, it's quite slow, you know, slow growing, but at least, you know, it's not declining. You know, many areas in, in Southeast Asia, uh, uh, we cannot find tigers anymore. But uh, at least there are some areas that uh, tigers uh, are recovering. I also would like to add here that uh, um, in, in the same Western forest complex, when Alan Rabinovitz, um, you know, he's written a book called Chasing the Dragon's Tail, you read that, and he took George Heller there, and they, George Heller said, there'll never be tigers here, this is gone. And, uh, you know, you see what a dismal condition it was in. And when I went in 2000, we would hardly find any prey animals to see, but as, as the Anax uh, monitoring was also tied with the intensification of anti-hunting operations, poaching, anti-poaching operations, a little bit of relocation. Uh, so the tiger's numbers have come back. And it's the best case scenario for anywhere in Southeast Asia, but still it has taken a long time. We hear a lot of people talking about doubling tiger numbers and this and that, but when you look at the real data, uh, it's, it's, it's not easy. It takes a while for the basic population to build up. Then, uh, then there's a period of rapid growth once the females are established and our territories. I think uh, WEFCOM is on the verge of getting to that stage of uh, uh, sort of really they'll see a bigger boom in population. So, uh, but the other thing that I want to emphasize here because I was involved in this program from the beginning is it is using the manpower of the academics, students, uh, professors, the forest department, everybody is involved, everybody shares a vision, but the science is done by a small group of people who really understand science. It's not left to the park manager where to put the camera trap, what to do. The science and the design come from scientists with based on peer reviewed literature and rigorous science. The implementation is done by uh, WCS, which is an NGO, other NGOs, WWF is involved, now professors of cassette art are involved. So it's kind of a wonderful vision of how this can be done. I mean, you know, and I was lucky to see it from beginning to for about a quarter century now. And this, I think, really is a model even for us. Instead of making everything a government monopoly, if we involve all sectors, but have the ideas from the best of science, uh, I think uh, Anak presents a very good case for that. And, uh, and uh, in some sense, when he talked about uh, India, what I would like to point out was that they were not using the methods used by the Indian government. They were using the methods that were developed in Western Ghats by WCS India into the cross WCS transfer of knowledge from India to Thailand. But he was able to take it and spread it within the government system in Thailand. This was his achievement, which is very, very hard to do, to change the way the government functions. And because of his, uh, uh, I would call conservation skills, he's been able to achieve that. So I, I think WEFCOM is probably where the future is for tigers in, in that part of the world. I am very sure we'll see more and more tigers there. So having heard that, uh, tiger story from Thailand. So he did chase the dragon's tail and catch it. Let me put it that way. And I <laughs> did succeed in that. So I would now like to invite Abhishek who, who has his own very interesting insights and what, him, what has been impressive about Abhishek's work is most tiger biologists tend to be very macho and get carried away by the size of the animal and naming it and link their egos with it, etc. Abhishek, right from the days as a student, was as focused on the statistics, the modeling, the science that is necessary, whether you're counting sparrows or tigers. That skeleton, that framework that provides monitoring its skeleton so it can stand up. You can add all the muscle later, but you do need that skeleton. So, uh, And he's worked probably in such a diversity of settings now using these models and estimating, but he's also not in modeler who stays away from the field. He spent a lot of time in the field himself. So, and that's what gives strength to these statistical modeling. There are good people like him and others 
a few, but they are very valuable. So I would like him to share his experience with us. Thank you. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Ram, for that very, very, for a first introduction, which was very kind, and then the second one that's kinder. Uh, so before I, uh, you know, start, I think, uh, given that most of the audience is uh, also kind of trying to understand what tigers are across the range, I think it'll be good for me to kind of give a, a snapshot. So obviously, as Dr. Khan mentioned, you know, tigers is used to, uh, you know, across a really wide geographic range, right, from, you know, Iran, Iraq, all the way to uh, Russian Far East and down to Bali and a, a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, area. But now, as Dr. Khan mentioned, they've been reduced. I mean, the, the you know, occupied forests themselves are only 6%, and only 6% of that has about 70% of the known tigers that we, you know, we know. So if you think about that, it basically means that they're just some dots on the map across the world which have you know, the most number of tigers um, that, need, that need saving or that need to be set, kept secure. And that, um, you know, that focus uh, or that, the, the idea that uh, those sites need to be secured for the long term uh, is what you know, organizations like WCS and, and Panthera uh, you know, created what was known as the Tigers Forever Protocol. Uh, basically, it was a, a strategy that these organizations can develop uh, where the focus was very clear. It was save those dots on the map uh, that have the most number of tigers, make sure that they stay secure so that they can repopulate the landscapes within which they, uh, which is within which they form. So all of the monitoring that, uh, you know, that uh, Dr. Karan kind of outlined kind of falls within, within that process. And, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the more intensive uh, uh, form of monitoring that Dr. Karan mentioned uh, is basically, you know, that site level understanding of how tigers are performing, uh, what are they doing, uh, how are they surviving, and how are they able to repopulate the rest of the landscape, uh, which forms a core of what I do uh, through Panthera. So again, as I said, uh, you know, Panthera works across a lot of sites uh, across the range. We work in about uh, six countries. Uh, we've got about uh, right now we uh, you know we are involved in in some way or the other we're involved in about 15 sites and at these sites you know our primary focus again as i said you know these sites are are the most important thing the most uh, precious you know piece of real estate when it comes to tigers uh, what we what we really are keen on doing is ensuring that those populations are safe and viable uh, so you know uh, so Although there are other layers to the population monitoring, which is how landscapes are performing, how they're connected, uh, a lot of our focus goes into making sure that those tiger populations are secure and that they are doing well. So a lot of our work involves intensive camera trapping year after year, looking at individuals uh, and making sure that you know, we are able to track them uh, and not track them uh, like in the tiger tourism kind of format where we know individuals by names, but actually look at their fate. Uh, and, if you look at, and if you look at tigers, again, uh, a very important thing about tigers is their social systems. And, and you know, a lot of the monitoring that we do has to reflect that social system that we are trying to, trying to capture as well. So tigers have a very interesting social system in the sense that females have nearly uh, you know, exclusive home ranges uh, and they capitalize on areas with good prey. So, uh, you know, if, you, if there is a habitat, there's a lot of prey, female tigers will pick up areas that are exclusive somewhat to them. And they have, uh, you know, they kind of take care of that little territory of theirs. And males are usually, you know, uh, they have a larger territory, but overlap with about three to four females in that, in that population. So if you, if you think about, you know, tigers as, uh, you know, uh, a small Lego unit or a Lego block. Uh, the the uh, females are like the basic building blocks. They're the ones that form the base of tiger society. So ensuring that those females are safe, uh, that they have uh, a secure area that they can breed in, that they can produce cubs in, and and therefore you know and therefore uh, you know help the population grow is a, a critical part of, of the work uh, that we do through the organization. So again, just to you know, explain the kind of places that we work in, they're very diverse. Uh, and if you look at most of South Asia, most of South Asia is doing decently well with tigers in the sense that there are a lot of tigers, there are a lot of small populations, but at least there are 
a lot of populations that are uh, you know, present within tiger landscapes. Uh, Southeast Asia is a bit of a different story. There are some places, again, Thailand you know, really stands out as a place with some of the best tiger populations that we now know. Uh, but places like uh, Malaysia uh, are, are doing quite poorly now. Indonesia is okay, but again, is a mixed bag. Uh, and of course, in other parts of mainland Southeast Asia, we probably don't have breeding tigers, uh, at least in the last few years now. And of course, then there's the Russian Far East, uh, which is quite different from uh, you know, how tigers are in South and Southeast Asia. But again, that's another uh, part of the landscape, which is actually slowly actually doing quite well. At least tigers in China are slowly coming back in the you know, northern border. And, and that's, that's been quite, a, quite an encouraging sign in the last few years. So in the places that we work, uh, as I said, you know, locking down the site uh, and making sure that tigers do well is our primary focus. And, and just to kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, highlight what that means is, uh, is when, when you find a population that needs to be secure, uh, we often put in a lot of conservation investment and conservation actions. You know, this could be like, as uh, Dr. Anak mentioned, this could be, uh, you know, protection uh, that needs to be done. So anti-poaching protection, for instance, uh, that needs to be put in. So how do you know these are working, right? And that's, that's the basic question that we are asking when we're trying to link populations to management. And that is, you know, for an organization like us and the organizations we work with, uh, Tigers are our currency. So if tigers don't do well, uh, basically we are failing at our job. And, and therefore, and that's where the monitoring comes in. And the monitoring comes in to tell us that our actions are right. And that the actions that we're doing uh, are not just, you know, are not just uh, right in terms of um, uh, right in terms of how we're doing it, but right in terms of it's really working for tigers. And only when we are able to link our actions like increased patrolling or increased protection and have that convert to tiger numbers doing better, do we really actually, um, you know, uh, can we actually say that we're having an impact in, in the work we do? And, and, and that's where it comes back to, you know, the title of this talk, which is an ecological audit monitoring as a, as a you know, tool as for ecological auditing. And because that's exactly what it is, because at the end of it, uh, if for tiger conservation to be successful, we need populations to perform well. We need populations to survive. We need them to reproduce and repopulate the landscapes uh, within which they're embedded. And, and that's what makes up, you know, a lot of the kind of work that needs to happen. And if you kind of zoom back uh, and start looking at the other layers of monitoring, that will in turn, in time, it'll reflect, right? You have one core that you've secured does well, females are breeding, they're able to populate not just their landscape and reach the carrying capacity that is set by the prey in that area, but slowly spill out. And you know, just to give another example, so Panthera works at a site just south of uh, you know, the, the site that uh, Anak has been working in for many years. We've just started some work uh, now you know, less than a decade uh, old, but the, you know, the benefits of tigers doing well from the from the central part of wefcom is showing up in southern thailand now the southern parts of the wefcom you know we're having tigers come out uh, you know they slowly every year we're having more and more tigers come out and and you know our monitoring team send the photos to anak every year and ask him if have you seen this individual and almost always he gets back saying yes we we have this individual from our from our trapping and it was a cub earlier and it's now you know now a breeding female in our area or something like that so that is you know the the power of the monitoring work because at the end of it that's what we need to show is how well the conservation actions we put in place are finally benefiting tigers and you know uh, it's 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 very easy to you know look at the situation in india and i can see most of our audience uh, from india uh, we hear about tigers every day, right? pretty much. Right? It's, it's a species that takes a lot of our attention in, in the news, in, in public uh, forums, and, and a lot of other spaces. Uh, but we kind of always forget how different the situation is in other countries, and especially Southeast Asia, where, where populations in the last decade are, you know, have been blipping out. 
uh, very, very slowly. So having strong monitoring to tell us how populations are performing uh, is, is a critical part of uh, you know, the work we should do. And, and that's exactly where it comes back to you know, uh, having that strong uh, link between the actions we put in on ground and how we are able to audit them, and and that's a very very uh, you know important part of uh, you know all of the work we do, and so yeah, so I kind of uh, wrap it up there and and then ask Dr. Karanth if he has anything else to lead on. Yeah, I I, I think uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Abhishek uh, pointed out was the spatial distribution of tigers, the ecology of these places itself has to be a part of the monitoring system. For example, let's say you're just putting camera traps. A home range of a female in Nagarhole or a high density area in India, or perhaps even central Webcom is hardly 20 square kilometers. You go to the Russian Far East, it's 600 square kilometers. So it's the same species, but the monitoring system has to be different. The scaling has to be different. Uh, Another point that I would like to highlight is that uh, you know you can develop models, but if the models are not rooted on empirical data and ground level experience, they don't perform well in the real world. In some sense, uh, the approach that uh, uh, Abhishek discovered uh, or described of hanging on to the source populations and using them to repopulate the rest of the landscape originated in India. And in fact, it originated much before, uh, much before uh, serious science on tigers began. It began with the idea of protected areas, them being strongly enforced, law enforcement being central to it. And a large part of the credit to that goes to the forestry departments in India, particularly the earlier generation leaders like uh, Kaila Sankla, HS Power, many others who realized that the way to bring back tiger was to secure these places. It was common sense in some sense. Unfortunately, much of the current thinking in conservation, much of the wider fuzzy thinking doesn't realize the value. So we had to kind of, uh, when I started working in the Western Ghats, uh, I started wandering in the Western Ghats in this whole area that stretches from the Goa border to the Southern tip of Karnataka. There were probably less than 70 tigers and they were going. Today in the la same landscape, there are 300 plus tigers roughly. So obviously human population has increased, development has come in yet there has been and the, at the center of it has been the source population protection strategy. This has been the strategy. But what we did with the data was able to document this much more rigorously. And uh, I used to be at WCS at that time, uh, but essentially this was a CWS cent uh, Center for Wildlife Studies volunteer driven project, which was funded by WCS. So, but because of the connection to WCS, which at that time also Panthera was buried inside WCS. We were able to spread this. It's like physics. It's the same in Thailand or India. We were able to share the best knowledge from monitoring in the Western Ghats and it's now circulated through the system. And again, I want to emphasize here, it was not at all Atmanirbhar. A lot of science is global. And we learned hell of a lot from some of the best brains in monitoring like James D. Nichols and David Anderson and others who had not worked on tigers, but had thought through the ideas that we are using. So uh, just to emphasize the connection between science and rigorous monitoring, a mathematician called Markov invented what are called Markov chains in 1920s in Russia. The mathematics was first used by scientists, by particle physicists who developed quantum mechanics in statistical physics in the 1950s. Wildlife biologists like uh, Bill Link and Jim Nichols started using it in wildlife monitoring in the 1990s. So there is a continuous thread of science. And if we say we are going to develop our own science and we are going to do it, our DFO will do everything, our IAS officer will decide what is science, then we'll never get 
there. So I think the illustration that we have covered today shows how science is truly universal and how monitoring has to be driven by universal science as it is in the field of agriculture, telecommunication and other things. So with that, we have kind of covered uh, 45 minutes uh, more or less. And I think it'd be good to open this up for a discussion, uh, but I want to make one pitch, which uh, my daughter, uh, Kriti, she runs Center for Wildlife Studies and she says, you must make this pitch and uh, particularly the model we develop of involving a lot of you are not tiger biologists, but uh, genuinely interested in tigers. And what we did right from the beginning was to involve interested amateur naturalists, but train them to a very high degree to collect data as good as scientists. And it was because of the involvement, serious involvement, not going and staying in a lodge and taking pictures and putting it on Facebook. Really serious involvement in monitoring on the part of amateur naturalists, which was a model developed by Center for Wildlife Studies, primarily my deputy, Dr. Samba Kumar, and I was struggling through the 1980s, that model is still relevant. And I think as conservationists, everybody should push the government to say that, that yes, we are interested. We want to do monitoring, but get us involved. I, I think that's, that has tremendous scope across Asia because Asian society is educated. We are prosperous and we have interested naturalists. They just need a bit more guidance towards scientific monitoring rather than just having a good time in the forest. So it's a small leap that has to be made. With that closing, uh, for any of the more technical information, you can go to the website of CWS, WCS, Panthera, any of these institutions, there are publications listed and I would urge serious amateur naturalists to really try to dig into the scientific publications to the extent they can so that the difference between science and what you need in newspapers, headlines, becomes very clear. With that, I close and we have about 14 minutes, 13 minutes left for questioning and Winnie uh, will take your questions and read them out because we find it that way. But when you ask a question to Winnie through chat or whatever, specify who you want to answer it. We, uh, we, it doesn't matter who the question comes from because similar questions will be clubbed by Winnie so that uh, the panel can do its best to answer your questions. Thank you. So I'll just go in uh, right ahead. And um, so, so a lot of the questions that are coming in are about inbreeding and genetic diversity in tiger populations. So do we know the genetic diversity of these populations? And is there a high risk of inbreeding depression within the fragmented population? So any of the two speakers can answer this question. Maybe I'll go ahead because I'm a little skeptical of this thing. So. Uh, the point is there are two processes that lead to extinction. One is demographic extinction. You bury the genetics completely and you see populations disappear. A species that was spread across uh, 30 countries is today breeding populations are occupying 1% of that former range. And this process has been demographic. It is primarily because people have gone and killed the tiger's prey, people have gone and killed the tigers and people have cleared the habitat. So that process still continues to be dominant. While genetics is important, if we ignore these other factors and focus on genetics as the driver, which was a bit of a fashion in the uh, 80s when the American zoos thought they could go and repopulate the world with captive bred tigers. And often these ideas get linked to the idea of releasing tigers and all, which are all management actions that are not necessary and not useful. So while genetics is an issue, it is one of the issues. Uh, and most populations get wiped out way before they get to that stage. Uh, given the situations we have, uh, we thought a lot about this issue as we uh, when we formulated Tigers Forever strategy, clearly one of the strategies has to be to encourage natural dispersal movements because tigers do move long distances. They can uh, disperse far as long as some sort of a permeable matrix is there. So coffee estates, other kinds of landscapes, sugarcane, as long as they have some stepping stones where they can get some prey, they do move. 
So I think that's a very powerful way of addressing this issue. Uh, I think there are a few cases perhaps where there's a lot of prey and no tigers. There are very few such places. Perhaps uh, something more interventionist is required. Uh, so I would say demographic process still is overwhelming the biggest threat to tigers. Okay, that's great. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, the next question is for Abhishek. So Abhishek, you mentioned that uh, there's a difference in societal awareness and social presence of the tiger in different countries. So have you found a difference in engaging with people and getting people involved in tiger conservation in different places? And is one of these cultural situations harder to deal with than the other? And what kind of resistance have you encountered? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. In fact, um, when you the general interest that people have for tigers, I think it's common wherever they are. In fact, even if they're not in a tiger country, uh, you know, people's excitement when they hear about tigers is always, you know, is always uh, a lot. And, and you can get a lot of people excited about funding tigers, about uh, encouraging tigers and having, you know, all kinds of uh, outreach, uh, you know, met for tigers. Uh, but I think what what becomes uh, what's what's universal again across across uh, tiger range is the people who live closest to tigers, people who are literally on the you know fringes of uh, you know habitats with tigers. Uh, they are the ones who you know suffer the most as well, uh, especially in countries like South Asia, where uh, in Southeast South Asian countries where tigers uh, more often than in Southeast Asia come out and you know either cause conflict or something like that. Uh, then you know the costs and they don't really outweigh each other very well. So that becomes uh, a bit of a problem. In fact, tigers are, uh, you know, called, uh, they're kind of classic market failure. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, emphasis and value placed on them uh, from outside. Uh, but uh, the reality is the people closest to them, uh, you know, suffer the most as well. So, so that actually does cause uh, quite a bit of a, a problem in terms of, uh, conserving tigers, but I would say it's across the board and it's not, it's not exactly, uh, you know, it's not different from one place to the other. Uh, the other thing that does change is social systems. Of course, you know, there's uh, also people talk about tolerance. So some communities are potentially more tolerant towards tigers than others. Uh, but again, it's not easy to have a broad brushstroke and say that, you know, South Asia is like this or Southeast Asia is like this. Uh, that's because at every landscape, again, you have communities who have learned to live with tigers for generations, for, you know, for ages before us. Uh, so it's, it's very, it's a very complicated thing. So just to give you an example, one of the places we work in, in uh, Indonesia, uh, it, there's a very interesting difference where the local Sumatran, uh, you know, communities, that live around this protected area, uh, they tend to tolerate conflict much better than the immigrant labor from Java, uh, for instance. So these kinds of differences occur and these kinds of complexities and you know, the difference in the heterogeneity that we see in communities makes you know, conservation actions complicated, but not impossible. So you know, it's again, very difficult to answer you know, if any area is, does better than the other, but uh, I would say that, you know, understanding that heterogeneity at a site uh, matters a lot and understanding the people who live around these tigers matters a lot. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So the next question is about the impact of poaching on tiger numbers. So uh, from any of the speakers, um, what is the impact of poaching on tiger numbers in Thailand and what is the impact in India? Oh. You want me to start Anak, 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 Okay, sure. I think poaching uh, is the major problem and is the, uh, the, the most important one driving many species in Southeast Asia to extinction. And uh, I, 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 I would say that, you know, uh, in, in the area with uh, weak protection, when you can hear gunshots, uh, you know, easily, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, when you walk into the forest, in even inside national parks, you can hear gunshots. Even in many places in Thailand, this is in that situation, and it's uh, driven uh, not only tigers, but you know people mostly they when they 
kill in Southeast Asia, they mainly kill samber, gars, bunting until they are gone from the forest. So, and then tigers gone too. So uh, when we try to uh, strengthen protection and you know, using better system to protect this species, you know, species, they coming back, uh, you know, and clearly, you know, with protection alone, it's, it, it's quite incredible. You know, a, a lot of people, when they see situation improving in webcom, just protection alone can grow back, uh, not only tigers, but tiger prey like Bantain now. You can uh, see them in big herds in the area with good protection. So, uh, but uh, uh, at one point when we started growing, you have some poachers uh, coming just for tigers, like in 2000. 10, 11, we lost about more than 10 tigers just by tiger poaching gangs alone. And then, you know, uh, uh, the rangers, they, they fought hard to try to uh, stop uh, the, the poacher gangs. You know, they lost their life, actually. Uh, some of the rangers in, 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 in this West, Western forest complex, they, uh, they, they, they lost uh, their life uh, by uh, those poacher gangs, but they're still quite determined and then, you know, right now, you know, after we arrested come some key poacher gangs, uh, now we did not see that kind of threat anymore. And that's why this helped, you know, speeding up the recovering process. Yeah, that's for Thailand. Okay, India, I'll summarize it very quickly. There are two kinds of poaching. When you use the word, one is direct poaching of tigers or direct killing of tigers versus killing the tiger spray. If you look at India as a whole, there's a huge part, there's a, there are some protected areas and good densities in parts of Madhya Pradesh, parts of Maharashtra, Western Ghats, the Western Ghats states and in the Tarai and Kaziranga. But if you, if you look at the vast stretch of forest through Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, a uh, lot of Northeast, Orissa, the tiger is not there not because tigers have been poached out, way before that the prey base has been eliminated because the tiger requires a solid prey base before it can reproduce. But once you have reproducing tiger populations, a single female will produce 15 cubs in a lifetime. They are a prolific species. So elimination of the prey, hunting of the prey is a bigger problem over most of India and perhaps most of Southeast Asia. A hunting of tigers becomes a problem when breeding animals are taken out, when the poaching spreads to the breeders. If uh, an, a tiger population naturally produces some surpluses, and this is why tigers did sustain quite a bit of hunting pressure. I'm not recommending hunting, but what I'm saying is they did take a lot of hunting pressure before they were killed, like... Uh, between 1875 and 1925, in that 50 years, nearly 80,000 tigers were killed in India for trophies and bounties. It is a horrendous scale of poaching that eliminates direct poaching. So both poaching is bad. And as Anak pointed out, and as Abhishek pointed out, this can't be stopped with sideshows. You need law enforcement. You need the effective protection against this kind of hunting of either prey or tigers. We have time for one question, maybe. Uh, yeah, since we're hitting close to seven, I'll just uh, 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 pitch one more question. So uh, one question that was asked is to increase the uh, to decrease inbreeding between different populations is uh, artificial insemination and cross like artificial cross breeding between different populations. Is that a viable solution? And any, anyone from the panel can answer. Yeah, I think I'll answer it quickly. I covered it. I, I think this is the second question on genetics. And I emphasize that these are not the fundamentally the biggest issues for tigers. You can move individuals. You, uh, you can improve connectivity. I think catching a tiger, inseminating it, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, has its own challenges. Uh, it's not easy to catch a tiger. I have caught some. I was the first one to catch and radio collar tigers in 1990. So I think we have to move away from this towards really looking at large populations, connecting them through relocations, uh, rebuilding corridors, uh, connectivity, and creating natural enhancement of creativity. Uh, uh, so I, I do honestly do not think our focus and energy 
should go into genetics all the time as the solution. Although it's very easy to work on genetics in a lab and you don't have to struggle in the field, I do not think it offers practical solutions for recovering tigers. Okay, uh, if, if any of the participants have further questions, you can email me. I've put yeah. my email address in the chat box and I'll be happy to forward your questions to the panel. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thank all. You. Thanks, Thank my you. guests. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.